Can a woman forget her infant so as not to have pity on the son of her womb? And if she should forget, yet will not I forget thee? Isaiah 49, verse 15. One of God's greatest creations on earth are mothers. For to them are entrusted not only the continuity of life in general, but also the life of good vocations in the church. Yes, parents are the first teachers, formators of children more than anyone else. But it is the mother who first makes the child understand love and feel love beginning from her womb. So it is more likely that a child is closer to the mother than the father. And when a child grows distant from the mother, that kind of brokenness is at times irreparable. The bond and oneness of the mother with her child is more than an umbilical cord. Why do we have so many insecure or mentally off people today? We can often trace it to that mother-daughter or mother-son bond that was broken beginning from the womb. God made mothers to be the heart of the family, to love unconditionally their children, even unto death. God therefore fashioned mothers to save their children from any kind of danger, especially from death. As the father is the head of the family, so the mother is the heart. Natural law normally makes it impossible for a mother to abandon nor forget her child. Yet God promises us, his spiritual children, that he will never forget us even if our physical mother does. Catholic biblical commentaries explain, if it is impossible for mothers not to love their children, how much more impossible for God not to love us, his spiritual children. Catechism in the Catholic Church 501 says that Jesus is Mary's only son, but her spiritual motherhood extends to all men. Lumen Gentium 56 adds that the Virgin Mary cooperated through free faith and obedience in human salvation. St. Thomas Aquinas, for his part, wrote in his Summa Theologica that Mother Mary uttered her yes in the name of all human nature. And finally, the Catechism of the Catholic Church 511 confirms this by stating that by her obedience, she became the new Eve, Mother of the Living. In the Wednesday General Audience on September 17, 1997, John Paul II gave a beautiful catechesis on Mary as Mother of the Church. He said, The Mother of the Church reflects the deep conviction of the Christian faithful who see in Mary not only the Mother of the Person of Christ, but also the faithful. She who recognized as Mother of Salvation, Life and Grace, Mother of the saved and Mother of the living is rightly proclaimed Mother of the Church, Mother of the Faithful, or Our Mother, to emphasize her personal relationship with each of her children. The title Mother of the Church expresses the Blessed Virgin's maternal relations with the Church, and we read this in several New Testament texts. In the Annunciation, where Mary gave her consent when she said fiat to the Messianic kingdom which took place with the formation of the church. At Cana, where she asked her son Jesus to exercise his Messianic power and told the servants, do whatever he tells you, thereby implanting the faith in the first community of disciples. On Calvary, in addressing the words, Woman, behold your son to Mary. 
the crucified one proclaims her motherhood not only in relation to the Apostle John, but also to every disciple. The evangelist himself in John 11:52, by saying that Jesus had to die to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad indicates the church birth as the fruit of the redemptive sacrifice with which Mary is maternally associated. Pope Paul VI himself declared during his homily at the Second Vatican Council itself that Mary is mother of the church. Being the heart of the family, it is against human nature for a mother to hurt her children. Yet, because of social influences and emotional prostration or disorder, some mothers can commit unthinkable crimes like abortion and other kinds of abuse against their children. Some years back, I came across a newspaper article entitled, Heartless Mother. I thought it was about a woman born without a heart, which is impossible. It was in fact about the mother who killed all her children cold-bloodedly. The story goes this way. The mother was left to take care of four young children. The eldest was no more than eight years old, while her husband was overseas working for the family skip. For three straight years, she had no one to help her raise her children and faced with 1,001 problems of keeping home. The young mother with four young energetic children all alone to fend for everything, from house chores to bills, with no life to call her own, could leave any woman isolated, stressed, and emotionally spent. She did receive some money from her husband, but it hardly made things meet. And most of the time, that's all there was of it. Only money, no letter, not even a phone call, or say hi, or ask how she was doing and the children. And one day, for some reason, the woman contrived of the story. Inspired from a soap opera, she watched that men who work abroad and who seldom went home have other families or have mistresses hiding somewhere. Then the husband lost his job, wrote for the first time the wife to tell her that he was going home for good. The children were happy, but not the wife. All the pent-up emotions, the anger, hatred, frustration, doubts, jealousy, and self-pity all welled up inside her. So much so that while the husband was sleeping one night, the wife took the kitchen knife and stabbed him several times without mercy, leaving him bleeding to death. Next, the mother went to the children's room and did the same, stabbed each one to death while they were asleep in bed. She did all this because she believed her husband left her for another wife and family, and her children tied her to them and was always at their beck and call. This she told the police when she turned herself after the mass murder. The title that splashed all over newspapers called her a heartless mother. We have heartless mothers because we have heartless fathers. A heartless society, at times a heartless church. God assures us in Isaiah 49 that even if the mother forgets her baby, which is naturally impossible, unless she is mentally ill, God will still never forget us. God gave us Mary, a real mother, who will never abandon us, her children. In Proverbs 17, verse 17, we read, The person who is a friend is always a friend. And a mother, a brother, or sister is born in the time of stress. 
We never really know who are our real friends and relatives when the going is right. But when the going gets tough, we begin to see their true colors. People in the world never desert their friends when riding high in prosperity. But if such friends run into misfortune, above all, if they are brought to death's door, people leave them on their own. Mother Mary does not deal with her children in this way. In all our misfortunes, and especially in death, which is our greatest affliction here on earth, this good mother is our life and our sweetness. Our life during our exile, our sweetness in the last hour, securing for us a calm and happy death. The Blessed Virgin Mary promised to Saint Dominic, the founder of the Dominican Order, that through the authentic devotion of the scapular and rosary, she will save us especially at the hour of our death and will secure heaven for us. Provided a person live a pure life of consecration, Our Lady of Mount Carmel promised to St. Simon Stock that the scapular would, one, be a sign of salvation, two, a protection in danger, three, a pledge of peace, four, that whosoever dies wearing the scapular shall not suffer eternal fire, fifth, the Blessed Mother promised to bring to heaven all those who were wearing their scapulars at their death the Saturday following. The devils revealed to Blessed Francis of Yepes, the brother of St. John of the Cross, that three things especially tormented them. The first, the name of Jesus. The second, the name of Mary. And third, the brown scapula of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Take off that habit, they cried to him, which is not just too many souls from us. All those clothed in it die piously and escape us. In the Hail Mary prayer, the Church teaches us to beg Our Lady to help us now and at the hour of our death. Consider the anguish of the dying. They suffer remorse over their past sins. They are filled with fear of the coming judgment and have no absolute assurance of their eternal salvation. But how quickly the devils flee from the face of this queen if we call on her at the hour of our death. It will surely be a victory over sin and death. Mother Mary gave 12 promises to those who pray the rosary daily, and among them, that they will not die without the sacrament, and they are predestined to heaven. Charles, a soldier, was the son of St. Bridget of Sweden. He died at war, so St. Bridget feared for his salvation. Her only hope was the rosary she gave him. The Blessed Virgin Mary revealed to her at prayer that because of Charles' love for praying the rosary daily, he was saved. Then Charles appeared to his mother, St. Bridget, who asked him how he was saved. Charles said that he saw the devil brought two accusations against the Blessed Virgin Mary before God the Father about him. One, that the Blessed Mother was unfair because she prevented the devil from tempting Charles at the hour of death. Two, that the Blessed Mother prevented Jesus Christ from passing any judgment on Charles because he was a devotee of her Holy Rosary. Pope Francis has this to say of mothers. Mothers are indispensable to society and the Church. By witnessing what it means to generously give oneself to others, to respect life, and to display tenderness and moral strength even in times of trouble. She gives us Jesus. She shows us Jesus. She lets us see Jesus. Mothers are the strongest antidote to the spread of selfish individualism, the Pope added. A word without mothers would be inhumane because mothers always know how to give witness, 
even in the worst of times, to tenderness, dedication, and moral strength. Being a mother does not mean just bringing a child into the world, but it is also a life choice. What does a mother choose? It is the choice to give life, and this is great. This is beautiful. Often the mother passes on the deepest sense of religious practice, for she plants and cultivates the seed of faith among her children by sharing prayers and devotional practices to her children, the Pope said. Saint Gianna Beretta Mola refused both abortion and hysterectomy while pregnant with her fourth child despite knowing as a physician that continuing with the pregnancy would result in her own death which later occurred. Pregnancy was always a difficult experience for Gianna. During each of her three pregnancies, she experienced hyperemesis, which means excessive vomiting. She also experienced intestinal binding and dysfunction, another gastric disturbances. These caused her much pain. Her first pregnancy went 25 days beyond her due date and had a labor that lasted 36 hours. Because of the large size of her baby, they had to use forceps to deliver her. During the course of her second and third pregnancy, she experienced similar difficulties and again went 10 days late with a long and painful delivery. Jana never seemed to lose her serenity during her deliveries though she sometimes would clamp down on a handkerchief with her teeth in moments of pain. Why? Because she always had in mind Mother Mary suffering with seven daggers in her heart because of her son Jesus and for us, her spiritual children. She appears to have always declined pain medications during her deliveries. In the second month of her last pregnancy, she was diagnosed with a large fibroid. A fibroid is a benign tumor of the uterus, and often it is small enough that one can leave it alone and allow the course of the pregnancy to continue normally. Her husband Pietro recalls that there were three options presented for Jana's case. One, hysterectomy the complete removal of the uterus to remove the fibroid from the body. This would be fairly low-risk approach for her situation. It would result, however, in the death of her two-month-old fetus and preclude the possibility of future pregnancies. Two, abortion, which both parents immediately rejected. Third, surgical removal of the fibroid. The risk as the continuation of the pregnancy. This third option, Jana Mola chose. Because she was a physician, Jana understood that the risks were several. The surgery on the uterus might irritate it to the point that the pregnancy would be threatened and would spontaneously abort. The blood loss can be difficult to control in the pregnant uterus. Surgery on the uterus under these circumstances also presented the danger that during the remainder of the pregnancy, there might be a reopening of the scarred wound from the surgery. A flared up of this sort could be dangerous from the rabbit bleeding that would ensue. At the end of the pregnancy, her physicians attempted to induce labor with oxytocin but contractions were not forthcoming. Other means were attempted, lasting from the afternoon of Good Friday until the next morning around 10 o'clock, but without success. Though her water had broken, labor was not proceeding. The decision was made to deliver the child by cesarean section. Jana underwent general ether anesthesia and a healthy baby girl weighing nearly 10 pounds was delivered. 
Jana's condition began to decline soon afterwards, with symptoms including an elevated fever, a rapid, weakened pulse, and exhaustion. Dr. Jana Mola died seven days later of septic peritonitis, an infection of the lining of the abdomen, notwithstanding the fact that antibiotics were utilized in her treatment. During the painful abdominal sufferings caused by the septic peritonitis, she declined any narcotic pain medications because she felt that such drugs did not allow her to be herself. In her final suffering, she remarked to her sister, If you only knew how differently things are judged at the hour of death, how vain certain things appear, to which we gave such importance in the world. Sadly, though, we live in an age where life and death decisions against the unborn child are made with an ever greater casualness, and pregnancies are terminated for even the most trivial reasons. St. Jana's example of heroic commitment to the life of her own child throws into clear relief the scandal of the easy abort mentality of our day. She believed that the privilege of being a mother, of being a cooperator with God in bringing forth new life meant always defending and protecting her children, whether in or out of the womb, even to the point of giving up her own life on their behalf. Jana Mola was canonized by John Paul II on May 16, 2004, and became the patron of pro-life. Love is a choice, and it's an action, it's got feeling. Love is the one thing in this life that still has meaning. Love tracks you down, and it can hurt you, it could nail you. Cross. Love asks you how much have you suffered and are you bleeding? Pain, pain will come. We are all guaranteed, it. but those who choose to love. save every baby, for it is God's gift to the family, rather than bring sadness. When accepted as God's loving gift, the child becomes a source of joy and blessings. Today, with sex education at the age of five mandated, children are already subjected to pornography and are initiated into sexual activities. The late Father John Hardon said that abortion directly from the womb and indirectly through pills and contraceptives are devices that kill an average of 100 million babies per year. Mother Teresa of Calcutta considered abortion as one of the worst plagues that has visited our planet Earth. Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, I feel that the greatest destroyer of peace today is abortion, because it is a war against the child, a direct killing of the innocent child, murder by the mother herself. And if we can accept that a mother can kill her own child, how can we tell other people not to kill one another? Let us pray. O oh, loving Mother Mary, your example in suffering everything, even your life, for the salvation of your spiritual children touches our lives. Please help us to realize 
that when God the Father gives us a child, He also promises to help in raising this child up and making him grow into the saint he is destined to become. But when you die, Jesus, on the cross, you already paid in advance for the salvation of this child. O oh, Saint John and Mola, intercede for all mothers today to be generous, even in giving their lives for their child, to give them the fighting chance to live, to become saints. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.